show We can be the best or we can be the worst We can be the best thing you ever heard With the motor singing and the grandstands ringing It's hard to put it all in words But this is how we ride, this is how we do Shades, letting her go, letting her rip, letting her fly, tossing her in sideways, living the life, letting her ride, high side, winning to die, cross her up on the cushion, crossing the line, cause some drama and some bullshit they didn't like, and if they don't like the mood, then we're ready to fly. This is how we ride, this is how we do. I know people are happy that this is how we do or back. I know I've been I've been hearing all about it. Please, Chaz, bring this is how we do back. I don't know. I don't know. We do have the guitar out once again. I mean, this is obviously those who tuned in to the emergency episode last night. Um, And I think that, that the emergency episode is the <clears throat> right thing to call it. Actually, right thing to call it. Uh, of course, the whole Tyler Walker, I, I guess, thing, saga uh, situation that has came up into the racing world now uh, with with the situations that we saw and discussed last night. Obviously, for those who tried to go back and watch the video, I was trying to trim some of the video out on the back end with YouTube uh, just because after an hour and a half, you know, once Spike comes in here and starts, you know, throwing his two cents in there after about 20 minutes he just starts rambling about you know things and and, and ideologies he learned in pro wrestling and applying it to real people and 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 things in life but uh it just got out of hand late into the night so we were trying to trim that video last night and it didn't necessarily uh work it didn't necessarily work uh so it accidentally got deleted but i was able to trim it myself and then put it back up, you know, put it back up onto, uh, onto the situation. Now it's funny, the guitars in the background, I talk all the time how I was in Hollywood and in, in, in Vegas playing music, living out of the car on the streets. And I was in those intense scenarios around, like I was saying last night, I've, I've been around these areas that Tyler Walker has talked about, never indulged into them as Tyler Walker has apparently done. But, uh, you know, there's some, you know, and maybe that's why I have sympathy for the situation. I felt bad for people like that. I would I personally like buy water with money I would make or something like that and just give it to the homeless people. I kind of was there by choice. A lot of those people are not, um, you know, and, and there's situations out there, you know, that I've judged a little bit differently, I guess, because of personal experience and caring about people and lives and, and things that matter, no matter if they're kids or adults, you know, it seems like, especially the, the white male of society, it seems like doesn't really, once they reach a certain age, it's like make it on your own or you're just thrown out over the, over the board, you know, kind of bar, uh, barbaric in a way. Um, we talk about, uh, you know, obviously last year we talked about mental health a little bit with the whole Jacob Allen situation. Obviously, if we're going to have sympathy for somebody being on the road in a sprint car and getting burned out, we should have a little bit of sympathy for this degree of burned out. This is burned out in life. You know, that's how I see it, at least. That's what I see. I mean, it, it, once again, if you got an ounce of sympathy for the for that scenario that happened last year in, in glorified sprint car racing, you got to be somewhat sympathetic and worried about this scenario as well. Um, and, and I mean, I see some of you people out there just saying some really bad things about Tyler. I see a lot of people with some, you know, reasons to say bad things about Tyler Walker, you know, saying we, he, you know, you can only give a guy so many chances over and over and over. And this guy has had chances over and over, but that's, that's the argument at least, you know, 
when do chances run out? When does rock bottom ever come back and float to the top? Does a rock just always stay at the bottom of the ocean? Uh, you know, uh, once again, back to the sympathetic situation. I don't, some people find it funny. I mean, there was a story at, uh, you know, I had at Bristol one time that was kind of funny, I guess, to some. Wasn't funny to me, really. Uh, we went out to uh, the Quaker Steak and Lube down there from Bristol. This was the World Outlaw Race when they put dirt on Bristol. And uh, we went down and uh, ate there. And while we were there, they had a um, hot wing challenge. And it was a scorpion pepper venom sauce uh, that was on these wings. And if you ate the six wings, you know, you you got like a T-shirt or something. You had to like sign a waiver and everything. So anyways, we didn't make it through, but we wanted to take these hot, amazing, insanely uh, spicy items. We wanted to take those and show them to other people. So in the process of doing that, one of the guys in the party, after we left, he took one of those barbecue or or scorpion pepper venom uh, wings and gave it to a homeless person on the side of the road who had nothing to eat. Some They they thought it was funny. Now, she was crazy. She was definitely mentally ill-willed. Um, but I didn't think that that was funny. And that guy who done that in particular at the time was a friend, I guess. Uh, but ever since he gave that to that person, I didn't think it was funny. I was cussing about it, you know, from the moment I saw what they were doing. Cause I went in and used the restroom, came back out. And I was like, what the fuck are you people doing? Like this person's starving. I mean, yeah, probably has mental health issues, but they're homeless. They have nothing to eat. And you're going to give them these scorpion pepper venom wings that we just had to sign a waiver for. They didn't, and they probably need to eat, so they're going to force themselves to to eat it. And then, I'm just saying, it's a level of cruelty that I think Spike gets to sometimes. Spike would laugh at that, I think, uh, if he was to have that scenario. Some people are having that level of cruelty um, to people when they're in a dire need situation. I don't have it. I do see some of the comments that people are having are, are about Tyler Walker are somewhat in that degree of category. Uh, I think they're in that give a homeless person, you know, uh, world-renowned spicy wings and, and watch them burn, you know. But I'm not in that category, unfortunately, for some of those people who want to think that way. And that's fine if you want to think that way. That's fine. But we do have a developmental situation into the uh, Tyler Walker scene scenario. He did post, obviously, in his post yesterday that we covered. He said he was going to go live from Skid Row, where he lives now. That's not the video we got. That is not the video we got. But we did get a video posted by Tyler Walker two hours ago on his Facebook page. And uh, this is the uh, Facebook page or, or the video on his Facebook page. This is uh, what we got here. Hold on, we'll unmute the tab. Sorry, we had it muted. Maybe muted is best. It's hard to even say what he's saying here, to be honest. I don't know. I've been working on this. I don't know. I'm still figuring out how to use this. I've been working on these backing lines all morning on this motor. I'm going to buy a little cheap motor. I'm $1,800 so I can... If it gets towed or the fuck is stolen, I don't give a shit. So that is our uh, 20 second update with Tyler Walker. Right there. I don't know. I've been working on this. I don't know. I'm still figuring out how to use this. I've been working on these backing lines all morning on this motor. I'm going to buy a little cheap motor. I'm $1,800 so I can... If it gets towed or the fuck is stolen, I don't give a shit. Now, obviously, you see a video like that, you know, reactions, talk about things being stolen. They don't really care. Uh, you're seeing an individual who it looks like, uh, to a to a certain standpoint, does it... Oh, you, you hope doesn't know what they're even really doing, What what's going on here. But... Obviously, in a moment of distress situation, I mean, look at the face there. If that's not the face of distress, I don't know what is. Um, We did have a bunch of comments and constructive ideas on what could happen here for Tyler Walker, with Tyler Walker. Uh, There was some comments below. um, People wanting to know how they can help him. Uh, And this guy actually had a very interesting idea. He said, uh, there are, uh, some people were saying, like, Somebody said there's no true way to help this or or had said that. And I said, maybe some are right. There isn't a, a way to truly help this. I don't know. 
Um, some guys had an idea. Paul Sands is a guy from Australia. He knows an athlete over there that is suffering from similar things or did and has made his way back. Uh, Charlie Baker, though, with the idea, I think that was very <clears throat> important to point out here as, as all these sprint car people are trying to figure out ways to help. Uh, he says there are ways, but it's going to take someone with expertise in the area like Kevin Rudine needs to send someone to L.A. and pick him up and get him to rehab. People will uh, say, why don't you do it? As in me, I'm in no position to do it. Rudine, however, has the resources and Rudine Foundation to help. Now, this is a, a great idea. I mean, obviously, the Rudine Foundation, I don't know who's really looked into it. Obviously, we see the uh, the race for Rudine uh, ra- uh, or foundation race every year. Uh, we see the Rudine Racing Team and and Race for Rudine Foundation is literally like their bio is about drug addiction. Together we can fight drug addiction. Um, just in the little uh, intro right here, you know, uh, it says we strive to address gaps in the system of care for those who are struggling with drug misuse, collaborating with community leaders and organizations to make a sustainable impact in our communities. For us, this will work or this work is personal when Race Rudine, which that is Race Rudine, died of a fentanyl overdose in 2016, his family created a foundation in his name to prevent others from suffering the same loss. Now, if we're going to combine racing and, and drug abuse, as we're seeing here with Tyler Walker, I would say this is a pretty uh, solid connection between a racing. It is Tyler Walker. I, I mean... Uh, that's a connection there and drug use. I think that that is obviously the case here. So once again, nobody really knows. Maybe Kevin Rudine has already re- reached out and maybe that bridge has burned or something because this isn't the first mistake Tyler Walker has had. And this is what a lot of people are saying is Tyler Walker's had all these chances and opportunities. People have tried to save Tyler Walker in the past. I mean, we ain't got like, ideology, you know, videoed examples of these saviors, but we don't know if Race for Rudin or Kevin Rudin or anybody over there at Rudin has tried to reach out for uh, uh, a Tyler Walker, but common sense says it's a, it's a, it's a perfect pairing. Honestly, it's a perfect pairing. You get the race, uh, race Rudin foundation involved with Tyler Walker and, and figure something, some way out uh, to, bring a, a former racer, race, super, sprint car superstar, which is what Tyler Walker was, uh, Kings Royal winner once again, PA Posse, uh, w- winning at Port Royal, w- winning mass events, was the Rat Bag Games, Rat Bag Car in this famous sprint car game that everyone apparently played, and that's why they keep making games. Tyler Walker was a big deal in the sprint car industry. Young Gun, went to NASCAR, who knows what happened in NASCAR. This may be uh, fallen effects from that experience, I'm not sure. Uh, but we, our, our interview with Jeremy Mayfield definitely was leaning towards that, possibly. But, um, you know, there's it's funny how Mayfield and him have... Anyway, anyway, I guess once you get pushed out, I don't know. But it does seem like the perfect pairing if Kevin Rudine, Race Rudine Foundation, can somehow help or, or assist Tyler Walker getting back into some kind of sense of normalcy. Now, obviously, that is a... Hi asked once again, we don't know. Maybe it's already happened. I I do think it's a, a collaborative idea. I tried asking around, hey, has Rudine reached out to Tyler Walker? Does this guy know if this guy's helped or this guy's tried to communicate or not? Who Who's doing all this stuff over there? I couldn't get an answer. So I, I tried to do a little bit of research before I went live here today after that video was posted. Only had two hours and had all this other stuff we want to talk about today. But uh, I, I think it sounds great. Now, we did have a... A few comments that were or were very liked here. Uh, Tyler Lee Smith, Leah Smith. I don't know how you want to say it. Uh, he he has a, a comment that fourteen people liked here, and it seems to be. I even liked it myself. It seems to stand firm. Maybe even for Tyler Walker in such a, a scenario, he said some of y'all have to understand that addicts cannot truly get help unless they want to help themselves first. I went through this for eight years with my mom. She was doing meth and fentanyl, kept saying she wanted help, tried getting her help several times, and each time she she never went through with it, and unfortunately, she died from her addiction a few months ago. At some point, addicts have to take accountability of their choices 
and really want better for themselves, and sometimes nothing friends and family say or do will help them unless they help themselves first. It's tough being an addict, but it's pure hell for friends and family of an addict. And unfortunately, I think Tyler Walker has friends, family, and a huge fan base that has come out of the woodworks ever seeing this wow video situation over the last two days. Uh, Madison Riggs, who is a late model fan. I don't know why she's commenting. Hopefully we can get her to a sprint car race very soon. That would be an interesting episode. Says yes, obviously has experienced something. But this is this is where I uh, chimed in with what I think really could help Tyler Walker. I'm I'm not a, a you know some people call me a psychiatrist when I when I hang out with them and we talk for hours. I do work through a lot of people's. It, it's funny when I go and run around the country or or now world and end up having actual discussions with people throughout the weekdays and we start talking about this life or that life experience or what their problems are. I end up feeling like I'm a fucking psychiatrist sometimes. I really do. Uh, but I think a lot. People say, oh, you're so smart. What are you doing in the dirt racing world? Well, I'm trying to help more than just dirt racing. But in this scenario, I think what I put here would help a Tyler Walker and is a response to his point of, you know, an addict must, you know, first help themselves. I said, I agree. But I also think that a guy like Walker could get a decent amount of assistance in getting out of that environment and into racing again. I think this is a very uh, serious thing. I think for a guy like him, it is environment that is also leading to these situations. Put him on a traveling team with simple tasks and maybe work him back into driving or something down the road again or, or something again down the road. I think that is a viable idea. I'm sorry to hear about your mom, but I'm sure even you experienced her change when her you or experienced her change, her usage based on who she was around and where she was. It's hard for me to even read my own damn shit. Yeah, it wasn't really any typos. But that's what I'm kind of saying. Like the environment that Tyler Walker is in, where he's having to, you know, I guess re repair vac whatever on this uh potentially stolen vehicle. This sounds horrible. That's an environment where, you know, you may be on drugs to even deal with that environment. You know, a healthy environment to potentially get somebody off of drugs, to give them something happy or, or viable to actually change their ways, I think would be a scenario. And maybe traveling teams out of the sorts, but I do think potentially this racing community, this racing world can help Tyler Walker in one way or another. Um and getting him out of an environment where that is the norm, where you're repairing a $1,800 camper, uh, you know, somewhere on the side of the road. You know, that's a little worse than, you know, helping around the shop or this, that, or the other. Something along those lines where you're in an environment, you're building towards something, like I said, on the track, maybe one day, maybe not. Who knows? I mean, Tyler Walker, the driver, is a pretty badass son of a bitch. But... I just think an environment change, you know, a goal change, you know, once again, not having to repair a car on the side of the road change in skid row change. I mean, there's a lot of things that could change here environment wise, surrounding wise, potentially friends and family. I mean, <clears throat> look, even me, typically, I don't really drink a lot of beer, for instance, or alcohol. You know, I like to stay clean, kind of I like to be very sober most of the time. But I get into an environment at the racetrack and everybody's having a hellaciously good time and we're all having fun. What happens? You know, they call it a social drinker, you know, a social drinker. That's what happens. All of a sudden, everybody is, you know, in, in, indulging into what everyone else around them is doing. And that scenario, these videos we're seeing of Tyler Walker definitely seems like he is in an environment where people around him are doing those things. And it's really hard to quit or to not want to drink and socialize, especially if you're talking about hardcore drugs, which I think, or personally would think, is a little bit more of a high or drunk or feeling than alcohol, which who knows, alcohol is a drug as well. It's just the drug that's legal and, cho and cho chosen. So I'm sure there's an argument to that. Uh, but, um, you know, I think environment's a big deal that has to change it with Tyler, Tyler Walker if anything's going to change. Now, would he have to want to make that change? Yes. Would that have to be something he wants to do? Yes. I mean, is there avenues for what I'm even describing right here already on the table and he's just not taking them? Potential. Potential that that's the truth. But hopefully, 
he hasn't been rejecting those offers. Hopefully, you know, Race for Rudin hasn't already uh, tried to do something and he's rejected those offers and we're just sitting here going in circles on the hope for Tyler Walker that everyone hopes he can do, but he can't do himself, you know, and, 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 and sometimes that's the reality in life. You know, sometimes that's the reality in life. You could get into or a family member or a, re- a relationship. And sometimes you view that person as better than they actually are. You know, sometimes you can uh, be sympathetic to the point that you're being blinded by the fact of who someone actually just is. I think that's why some people are having frustrations because they may want Tyler Walker to be off drugs. They may want Tyler Walker to be better in life. And they possibly believed that for years upon years and tried to invest into that better Tyler Walker that they envision. But the the envisionness, the, the the projection of who Tyler Walker is in their mind is not who Tyler Walker is in reality. You know, I'm sure we've all experienced this, especially in the relationship department. You think that somebody is better than what they are. You imagine this greatness, but in reality, it is not. You know, I'm sure not only towards someone, but same things probably people probably envisioned into you as you're going to be something better or something along those lines, and you're just are what you are, and that, and that's fine. But when it comes to these scenarios, you're on the side of the street in a van, and you're Tyler Walker. I mean, you think sometimes you got to get woken up. Hey, maybe you might want to be this envisioned idea more than what you are, and actually change. Change is hard, though. Change is hard. We see the stupid little TikToks and little memes all the time. Sometimes people are just who they are. They're never going to change. Don't try to change them. Sometimes people do change. Though I, I, I've, I've changed over the years multiple times on thoughts and topics, but it is hard to do that. It is hard to do that. You have to get to certain points in life and really uh, judge yourself, challenge yourself. Are you right or wrong? And even if it benefits you, did it benefit me or did it benefit everybody? Also, it comes down to selfishness on if a person wants to change. And sometimes uh, selfishness is almost, uh, in today's science, they're saying that selfishness is almost genetic. Some people are just genetically more selfish than others. I mean, who knows why that is, but it is just, you know, they're starting to understand that it's something that's just happened in certain breeds of human beings, for instance. You know, so there, hopefully selflessness can be taught if that's the case. Selflessness is hard to, to be taught, though, sometimes because everybody's always back to that uh, genetic foundation of, you know, kill to survive. It's all you got to eat to survive. I mean, that's that's, you know, the base foundation, you know, it's to live. And sometimes you inherently needing the ability or, or feeling to live is what's going to make make sure that you eat first no matter what what you need is what's more important so hopefully people can reevaluate what they're doing maybe they can think about some of this stuff well maybe feeling this way is wrong maybe i need to change this change that and maybe some of these opportunities that we're talking about thinking about are going to present themselves to Tyler Walker and he can really start to think about you know how he's here and how to make sure it never happens again. But we can all want, we can all desire, we can all strive, but you, you, you never know. You never know. But this situation is, is, is very sad. Um, it's the, developed over the, the past few days, unbelievably. I mean, the video that Tyler took down yesterday had 80,000 views in a, in a matter of an hour or so. Um, this, this video, I don't even know where it's at, but it's going to get around just as much as well. Uh, it is it is pretty uh, insane. It is it is pretty insane uh, what what's happening here. But hopefully we do get some developments. Hopefully Tyler uh, does uh, take up any opportunities. I'm almost 100 percent sure that opportunities for things to change here are being presented to him. I do think though the race for Rudin Foundation. This is your wheelhouse. What a perfect. I mean. I I don't know outside of a promotion or a race every year for promotion for promotion foundation or for a promotion of the foundation. That's about all I've heard. What would be the best damn story that the race routine foundation could ever have in the world than to rescue rehab and revive Tyler Walker. Hell, you got some race cars you could throw them in at the end of the year or something like that. I'm just saying it sounds like a hell of a marketing idea for y'all to somehow help Tyler Walker here get back to 
the fucking T-Dub, the real Tyler Walker. Just an idea. I, I don't know if it's happened, been presented. Maybe they won't touch it. Maybe there's ins and outs. They can't do it. Maybe we don't understand the whole situation. But I think that's, a, a, a once again, a perfect pairing. Race, race Redeem Foundation, Tyler Walker, let's make something happen. I think that would be a great idea, uh, scenario to come out. Now, back to racing. We're, we're trying to make this episode... A little bit short. We are going to move on from the Tyler Walker situation. Let's check the chat. What are some reactions that are happening right now uh, in the chat? Uh, Love your work, brother. Hope to snag a picture with this weekend. If the rain doesn't screw us, yes. Uh, You must be from Knoxville. Knoxville is in in trouble. Uh, Cosmo says he is definitely strung the hell out. He is. Um, Are you playing the guitar for us tonight? I don't know. We may be doing something at AJ's down there at Dingus here in the very near future. That's what some people, we we were discussing it last year. Uh, Hold on just a second. Looks like somebody's trying to call while I'm on the show. Anyway, um, we are, sorry, I did not expect that to happen. We'll go ahead and mute this so it doesn't happen again. Uh, but maybe, I'm not sure. We may be doing some guitar stuff, but it ain't going to be on the show here tonight. No, it ain't going to be on the show. I got to get some songs. I got to get a set list uh, going on to the show or on to like, you know, I need to be able to play every song without ever, you know, missing a beat. Anyways, into the racing situation of the scenario. Funny enough, Kevin Fry is trying to call me while I'm on the show. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me message him uh, and say, hold on live right now. Or maybe he knows I'm uh, live right now. Maybe he wants to call in and give some uh, thoughts. Um, but um, on to the sh- maybe he wants to call in. This ca- the, ca- the guy who's trying to call me, Kevin Fry, Callum Screw Chief. I don't know if he wants to chime in in thoughts or something like that. That would be cool, actually. But Callum Williamson did come in. Speaking of perfect pairings, it seems like the perfect pairing is this 39 Tron car and, and Callum Williamson. Obviously... Came into the Lincoln Speedway. First time in America, guys. First time in America. We're going to get on to some racing topics here because we're already up to a half hour. Um, uh, Callum Williamson comes in here. First time in the United States and is pulling wheelies like this in the 39 car. People, uh, old equipment ain't right. Well, the equipment just pulled a damn wheel stand all the way down the front straight away at Lincoln. Look at this. And carried it. I had several PA fans and people say they had never seen a will stand that high for that long at Lincoln Speedway ever. They haven't seen it that way ever uh, be done. So Callum Williamson, obviously, that did not help his qualifying lap. Um, it didn't end up being a great night for Callum Williamson in the debut of the 39. Obviously, after this happened, starting a little deep in the heat race, made some passes in uh, the B main. Um, but... For those who didn't get to see it on Flow, I will say that there is a channel that caught my eye. Matt Faust here on YouTube. Go ahead and check him out. Subscribe. He's at 663 subscribers. Uh, This video's got 5.1 thousand views already. Weldon Stern Memorial and Callum Williamson USA debut. Uh, He kind of does a vlog-ish style video here. Uh, It's kind of a vlog-ish style video of the Weldon uh, Sterner Memorial, um, and it does show Williamson and, and some other races, time trials, heat races. He kind of covers the whole night main event. Uh, somebody who really jumped off the screen for those Australian fans is Ryan Newton. Uh, of course, Ryan Newton making the trip over into uh, PA here recently. You see his Lincoln results here on the screen. Uh, Ryan Newton, I believe, yeah, time trial, first in his group, second overall, uh, third in his heat race, Started second in the feature and ended up fifth. Of course, Ryan Newton, uh, driver from the Sun Sunshine Coast uh, from uh, Australia. We did some filming around the Gladstone Raceway or Speedway over there, the McCosker Gladstone uh, Speedway. Go check that out. Ryan Newton was one of the drivers who actually had a GoPro on in one of his last um, races in Australia. So Ryan Newton finishing fifth. Uh, obviously, once as I said, Callum Winston didn't have the greatest luck on uh, uh, Lincoln on uh, Saturday night. Sunday night, though, look at this. So we get over here to um, Selins Grove. Freaking notifications just popping up left and right. It is pretty sad, though, this Tyler Walker deal. Sunday pops up. Callum Williamson and the Trone team, they go out to Selins Grove, okay? And I'm having to combat this because after uh, Saturday night, I had so many texts. Callum's a bust. 
See, you're fucking... It. I had so many people just rimming me. Oh, well, you need to deport him. Oh, send his ass back. Just may, uh, some of them were Spike, obviously. Spike's a horrible individual, horrible person. Shouldn't be listened to at all by anyone with a sensible soundness of, of rationalization and logic. But we get to the next night. Callum Williamson's second day, guys. Second day in the United States. First time on a half-mile dirt track at the huge Sellins Grove. This is the Knoxville of Pennsylvania. Sellins Grove here. Qualifies seventh. Guys, do we need to put this list up here for, for some of you people? Qualified seventh. Out-qualified Justin Whittle, or Whittall, as we joked with them. Out-qualified Davey Frantic, Devin Borden, Lucas Wolf, Ryan Newton, obviously, there's Steve Buckwalter, Mark Smith, guys. And he was two tenths off of the new track record set by TJ Stutz with, with a dish wing, for some reason. He was a, a half-tenth. No, three hundredths of a second behind Danny Dietrich. Six, or what is that? Seven thousandths slower than Freddie Raymer. Seven thousandths. It's basically the same time. You got us six two nine six three zero six three six. That's like the less than a blink of an eye almost. So, comes out here in his fifth lap on a half mile in his life, qualifies seventh. Okay? And then goes out there, runs uh, second in his heat race. Obviously, this is the, the I, and I had trouble doing this, the Sellins Grove Speedway. I had trouble keeping up with it because there's like so many issues around Sellins Grove and their social media platforms and all that. I had trouble trying to keep up uh, with the Sellins Grove Speedway on this, uh, on, on the results and their postings. Um, but as I said, Heat Race came along, uh, finished second right there behind Devin Borden, another guy I feel a little attached to for uh, getting over there to the PA racing scene like he did a couple years ago. So my guys, as somebody called me and said, your guys went one, two in the heat race, I guess so, uh, of Devin Borden and Callum Williamson. TJ Stutz in third, new track record holder, outran the track record holder in his first heat race ever on a half mile. Of course, uh, you had more heat races, heat two and heat three. Uh, Davey Franick, a really good race car driver. And then picking up the win uh, in the main event was uh, Austin Bishop. I believe this was his first 410 sprint car main event win in Pennsylvania. So Austin Bishop piss, uh, picking up the win. Uh, Callum Williamson ended up sixth in his first ever half mile race of his entire life. Guys, this is, I, I, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty fast. It's pretty impressive. Those counting it as like, oh my God. After Saturday, should have been like, oh, wow. I joked with the team and said they should chop Callum's foot off in half, you know, just uh, take a blowtorch, measure four inches back from the big toe, chop it in half, carterize it. All right, we won't be pulling willies anymore at Lincoln. But that big foot helped come uh, Sunday at Sellins Grove to be so impressive right out of the get-go, right out of the gate on a big, giant half mile. The Sellins Grove Speedway is basically Knoxville. It really is. That's why Brian Brown goes there, runs so well, in my opinion. The shape of the track, how it's linked is, which is is a good uh, identifier for how good Callum may do at the Knoxville Nationals. His team is planning to go there. Um, now, also, I put there in the video a discussion I wanted to have with the PA racing scene in general. Um, you know, I've been having these discussions. I was like, uh, discussions with people on the phone, off camera, obviously. And I was like, you know, PA has slowly become, with this new transition of high limit, um, outlaws, you know, all stars basically going away, which high limit is the all stars, but the new traveling way around the country, in my opinion, still. Um, but you have a gap here, and some people have talked about this this gap for the all stars, this pre-outlaw, pre-national race car driver level that the All-Stars was. It kind of, it was a little bit of a schedule, a little region. You traveled a lot. You raced a lot. There was good drivers. There were mediocre drivers. You, you hit local scenes like PA all the time. Really got challenged. You went to Ohio. You really got challenged. You had a swing to the Midwest. You had a swing to the upper North Midwest. They even had a Knoxville date. So you could probably you could go on the All Star Tour and kind of get a taste for that national scene. How good are you going to end up, or potentially could be, you know? And and then you race the All Stars for a year or two, and then you go to the Outlaws. It was kind of the pre Outlaw scene was the All Star Circuit of Champions. We don't have that anymore because of the high limit uh, upgrade that 
you know, they did for the All-Stars, took it national. And then also the World Outlaws, they've always been there. So we have seen a couple other little series pop off in the regions. You know, you got the Maverick series. Uh, you got a lot of racing in Ohio, by the way. There was like 42 cars at one of their races this last weekend. So there's a lot of cars in Ohio. Um, but that all-star level where you faced really premium driving competition and you didn't really have to travel much and you race for a decent amount of money or for a decent amount of money, that went away. And I think that Pennsylvania, when you look at it, like I, I noted on my socials and on my posts, Saturday night, the highest paying 410 sprint car race at that Weldon Sterner Memorial was was there for $20,000. That was the most highest paying main event for sprint car racing in the country. The World of Outlaws was 12000 to win at Tri-State, and High Limit was 12000 to win at Salina. The Weldon Sterner NPA, 20000 to win. And now, obviously... You know, not only do they have, you know, singled off big paying events, you have your outlaw swing that comes in there. You get to test yourself against the outlaws. You now have the high limit series that's come through there. You know, the uh, the Weikert Memorial that's coming up here in May is uh, 75000 to win now. I think May for Pennsylvania racers is kind of the new month of money. You know, if you move that Weldon Sterner to like the first week of May, I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but... It would pretty much make the month of May uh, a huge month because you'll have outlaw shows, got the high limit shows that are coming in there. The the you know you're obviously already weekly kind of high level racing action, and then you have your Bob Weikert there at the end of the month uh, with high limit now for seventy five thousand dollars. So if you could think of a scene though, not just in May, that you could test yourself race against high level competition. You don't have to travel as much with diesel and, and fuel prices. Who wants to really do that anymore or, or finds that viable? You kind of, I think, if you're a team or a race car driver that somewhat wants to prep before you go to that outlaw or high limit scene now, traditionally you went to the All-Stars, but now I think you might want to go to PA. And if something works uh, decently out, you find you a hot little local or something and you have a family or something and you want to be just a race car driver for big money and be outlaw and high limit ass and just be local in PA for the rest of your life. You want to do that life? Okay, that, that's great. But I think if you go to PA and you race that scene, maybe take a trip to Eldora for a King's Roll, maybe take a trip to Knoxville, take the trip to Volusia, you know, obviously Charlotte World Finals. In a year or two, I think you're getting enough experience racing there and going back and forth and, and premium you know, competition almost on a weekly basis that you could make that jump from PA racing scene to outlaws or high limit. I mean, we see successful examples of that all the time. Look at Brent Marks. Look at Anthony Macquarie. We're seeing those guys. I mean, Brock Searfoss did it. I don't know if he really dominated the PA scene. I don't really think so. But I'm simply saying... Did get the outlaw win there prior to going national, but I think now without the All Stars being intact and being around, if there was something that slots into that, well, do this for a year or two before you go to the Outlaws. This PA racing scene in today's world now with the vacancy is that that's where you go. That's where you will get the most bang for your buck action competition. And kind of wherewithal of what you can do. Now, you may have to learn how to drive down the road a little longer to go national. But, once again, unless you're going to go national, why would you do that? I mean, you need some kind of platinum driver agreement, you know, really to find that viable to drive up and down the road like the outlaw or high limit teams do. So, anyway, that's a, that's just a thought to ponder on. I think that, you know, Callum and other drivers coming over here, like I said, Ryan Newton involved in this uh, uh, PA uh, swing of sorts. You know, you see a couple guys trying to go over there. Uh, you got some things definitely happening. And uh, even, you know, young drivers like Austin Bishop, locals to be able to come up in that area, kind of get their feet wet into different, uh, you know, lanes of success is uh, very interesting and, and, and very, uh, I think, empowering for that region. And, and and if you have potentialities to want to do more than that, I think this is where you go. If you're somebody in the Midwest or something and you used to traditionally go to the All-Stars, maybe you relocate to PA for a year. 
And maybe that may get you geared up for a, an outlaw tour of some sorts, more so than just running Knoxville weekly and going up to Houston's every now and then. Now, there is going to be a significant rise in big time sprint car racing in the Midwest with the two national series coming in and out like they're doing this year. So, I mean, you'll have outlaws in Midwest. High Limit will be down south this week, I think it is. Um, but then after that, you'll have the outlaws go to PA. High Limit kind of stays here in the Midwest. Right as outlaws are leaving PA, you have the high limits going that way with Kokomo and New York and PA and the Weikert outlaws are more so coming back to the Midwest and then the outlaws are in the Midwest and then, you know, they're going to leave back out and then the high limits come in. So it's, it, it, there is going to be a lot of action in the Midwest, but on a, on a consistent basis, I think you're going to find it out there in the Pennsylvania region to, to slot underneath. And maybe that'll be the new battle of the regions. Obviously, it's hard to forget about California. You know, are these, is PA going to be in that all-star slotted region or are you going to have now more so badass regional drivers and teams going national? You know, California's tough. They're going to have two months after the Knoxville Nationals of, uh, you know, what, like 100,000 to win at, at Skagit, 100,000 to win Gold Cup, 83,000 to win Roth. From the end of the Knoxville Nationals to the end of September, you want to be over there on the West Coast, basically, racing in California. There's so much big money racing happening over there. So that scene's it, it, it exploded as well. Weekly and regional racing kind of benefited, in a way, uh, substantially, if you think about it, from this split with High Limit and the World of Outlaws. Because now they're getting a double dose of high-level national 410 racing action. That pays more. So it, it's hit and miss. It's hit and miss. It's hard to understand or hard, hard to really judge. I mean, will there ever be something that could slot into the all-star bracket and be that pre-outlaw kind of scene? Maybe that's impossible to reach, but I think if you do it right, you do it smart, PA is going to be the best viable option for you as a race car team and driver. Anyway, let's see what the comments are saying. Maybe there's some comments on that. Definitely not happy because I'm giving credit to PA members. I would like to see our track start sooner out here in South Dakota. Weather permits permitting like they do in PA icebreaker, just a wish. But our drivers don't like or don't have the funding like PA drivers get. And, and, and you know, I got a lot of uh, Knoxville fans who are mad at me right now. They think that Knoxville shouldn't start racing until the beginning of May. Like they think that Knoxville starting their racing season or attempting to this last weekend is a big mistake. And they also think that Knoxville ending as soon as they do is a big mistake. A lot of people I've noticed in the Midwest wish that racing or seem to want racing to start at the uh, beginning of May. And at Knoxville in particular, a couple fans saying that it should go all the way until uh, the beginning, p potentially the middle of October instead of ending like they do, I believe, at the end of August or first week of September, something like that. Um, and then obviously the late model event. But they think it should go into October, possibly second week of October, because the rain and the, the weather in this area is so hit and miss at this time of the year. They just rained out their opener this last Saturday night. Uh, this weekend does not look good. Does not look good for the outlaw race. Hopefully that will change. Hopefully that will change. We will see. But Pennsylvania, they're not in the middle of the low pressure system. Do you know that there's areas? I actually lived there for two years. There's areas in Iowa that are colder than uh, uh, Anchorage. Alaska. Did you know that? There's areas that are colder, and that's because of the jet stream and how it falls. Now, the jet stream doesn't fall uh, into PA the same way, uh, so you could have a decent weather, uh, a weathered weekend in PA in even February or March, like they've been racing, like you said. And the one benefit that PA has, and I think this is another deal, another all-star deal, they got the fans, guys. Pennsylvania has the fans that are willing to come out and, and spend money. Now, obviously, they've had struggles. Some are blaming streaming, this and that. But there have been some big crowds for PA events that most other regional weekly crowds cannot even touch uh, as far as numbers. I'm not talking about enthusiasm or we love our racing. I'm talking about as far as like numbers, sheer numbers of people who can show up at the racetrack and pay to get in to watch their local stars PA is pretty damn good. PA is pretty damn good when it comes to number of fans in that region that are willing to pay and treat their locals like superstars. And that's pretty hard to find. That is pretty hard to find. So that fan base over in PA, 
I, we, I would love to just, you know, take, pick it out and plant it up at Houston's, plant it down here at Knoxville, plant it over on the east or west coast, plant it in all these different areas, but it ain't going to happen. Just like look at the attendance at Sellins Grove. Look at the attendance down there. You know, it was, or not Sellins Grove, at Salina. Look at the attendance. Salina was horrible for the, for the high limit series. Southern Oklahoma, high limit series, Ardmore, horrible. Horrible. RPM Speedway Sunday, High Limit Series, the next closest thing in the world of outlaws. Look like 400 people in the stands. You know, these shows aren't viable, logically. Now, with streaming, it may change the game. But I know Sellins Grove, I hear, had a, a slouch of a crowd, kind of. You know, Lincoln, It's it was a big event. They got their people. You can almost judge based on the infield. Infield attendance is huge at some of these tracks, too. Fill up a lot of people. But... I think the PA fan base is what enables that situation to happen more so than anything. Uh, Chaz, I am in South Dakota, Dakota. I almost said it right, Dakota. Born and raised, but did the PA tour in early 2000, and I was impressed. And yes, you're right. The fans are the best out in PA. It is It is very true. Uh, Eric Edmondson saying that. Uh, Keystone Root says, correct. Zirfoss did not dominate the PA scene, scene just port for a year or so. Um, look at the money Knoxville is losing out on. I, I mean, they might be losing out on it. If they started racing last week and it was 40 degrees, I don't know who's been to Knoxville on a weekly race here. It's it's not comparable to Williams Grove or or Port Royal or, or something. Now, it may be on a light night, but a weekly crowd at Knoxville, I mean, it's it's okay. And obviously, Knoxville has one of the biggest grandstands in the world, so it's hard to judge, you know, what's little. You know, a half-empty grandstand or a a tw- a, tw- a twenty percent grandstand uh, at Knoxville is two times the grandstands that you know Red Dirt Raceway the other night could have, or Riverside could have uh, coming up tomorrow with High Limit, or two times the grandstands of some of these facilities. You know, a a thirty percent grandstand at Knoxville fills up I fifty five or something. You know, I'm I'm just saying, and even their grandstands in comparing uh, to Williams Grove. Knoxville does have the huge grandstands. They don't have the infield. You know, they you can watch the racing from the infield, but the infield experience in PA is somewhat very uh, traditional-esque, and it seems like something that every track kind of wants. I know that, I believe Sellins Grove is trying to make it to where they can dig a tunnel. Um, BAPS, I think, is trying to make it to where you can have infield attendance as well. <coughs> so it's a thing that people recognize as something that fans like to do. They like to be in the infield, like at Lincoln, like at Williams Grove, like at Port Royal. These facilities are built that way. I never really ever saw that until I went to Terre Haute, you know, when I first saw the, the whole tunnel to go under the track and then obviously going to P- Pennsylvania, but it was foreign to me. But I understand it business-wise why that is a very viable reasoning thing to incorporate. It's a very interesting experience to watch from the infield because you don't get no dust in your eyes, for instance. Um, Jonathan Winnett says, I think NARC is the place to, to step up to. Seems like the driving style acquired from West Coast is dominating on short tracks. Please don't reference Corey Day on how great uh, West Coast drivers are. Corey Day just couldn't make the A main the other night. Or, well, he couldn't make the A main out of the heat race. He finished sixth, I believe, or seventh in the heat race. Ryan Timms and and five other drivers passed Corey Day at Sal- Salina High Banks. And I believe Corey Day started fourth in that heat race. So he fell back three spots in a heat race when they got on a big racetrack. When they got on a big racetrack, Salina isn't a you know a big track, but it was built like a big track. It's high speed. You got to be on smooth on the on the on the wheel. Corey Day was just getting embarrassed, in my opinion, at Salina. Now he charged through the A main, and that's great. But if you want to hang your hat on how great NARC drivers are, some are good. Obviously, we can go down the Macedo, the Sweet List. You know, we could go to Larson, up Abreu. All these guys, I'm not saying they suck, and I love short track drivers. I'm vouching for them all the time. But I think it is halfway a little easier to come from that PA scene where you get a mix of the short track at Lincoln. You get the big kind of slower down, slick surface of, of Williams Grove. You get the blast, the boards experience at Port Royal with the slick float through the middle experience. You get BAPS, kind of that mediocre, medium-sized track that's really coming back right now. BAPS may be the best race track over there, personally, to my in my opinion. You get this mediocre size, you know, three-eighths-ish mile track. You get to really kind of figure out how to drive that. And then if you want to have fun and learn Knoxville a little bit, you go to Sellins Grove, you get that experience. So 
I'm not so sure if that's the case. I think what happens more so with the West Coast drivers is West Coast drivers are ready to get out and leave. People don't want to be stuck on the West Coast. I think that people don't have a problem being in PA as a full-time race car driver. We see the success. We see the, the amount of money that can be won there. I think on the West Coast, nobody wants to be there and stay there and be a professional driver in comparison to Pennsylvania. You can make a living racing race cars and have a family, have a life, and, and be a superstar. I don't really see that in the in the West Coast example. So I think what happens there is you get more guys like Sweet and Macedos and Corey Days and these guys going out, Abrews, and going out and racing the rest of the country and, 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 and national suit and all that because they just don't want to be on the West Coast anymore. Or I think you could have some... Similar examples from Pennsylvania, if it wasn't so enjoyable to be there and drivers were kind of like the West Coast forced to leave Pennsylvania to go out and prove themselves and do things and make it in racing. They don't even have to think that way like the West Coast guys seemingly do. You don't really get national clout uh, as a West Coast driver. I mean, look at the Justin Sanders deal. You know, 2019 was one of the best in the world. Didn't get real a, a lot of national clout, got some rankings on some websites, but nobody's like, oh, they didn't They didn't feel that kind of domination was comparable to Danny Dietrich in PA. It seems like you could do so much in PA and be perceived as like this big, giant ordeal. And respect and ego is huge in motorsports, especially when it comes to the drivers of these race cars. They want that. They want that recognition. So I feel like you could get that style of recognition racing in PA against the outlaws and all that stuff versus the West Coast example. And if, if if PA didn't get that, I think you'd have a lot more drivers try to leave that PA scene and go out there and you'd have more examples than just, you know, Logan Shuhart or something out there racing the outlaws from the Pennsylvania area. I think that's one of the bigger determinations and differences between a West Coaster and an East Coaster is the West Coasters are just trying to get out and go somewhere and make something of themselves. When the guy in PA, he don't have to get out and go and do anything to make something of himself. He could be a star just staying at home. And I don't think you could do that on the West Coast in today's world. I don't think you can. You got to leave like Corey Day. You got to leave like Rico. You got to go out like Larson. You got to get the hell out of there. He, I, oh, we just telling Justin Sanders to get the hell out of there. Go go whoop some ass. He did well in the Macri car, but I'm just saying. You had to do that to get that recognition. Uh, Jason, you're on 100%. Well, who's Jason? Jason, I think Knoxville would benefit from racing later. Cars follow the money after the Nationals anyway. They do. So then why would you race afterwards? Uh, Chaz off topic, but curious if you have a personal track count you've attended. Uh, no, I could try to add up some. Uh, it's a lot, though, but I want to knock some off. I do want to knock some off. I do want to get out there still and, and attend some racetracks that I haven't been to. Uh, there's still some in um, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Believe it or not, in Ohio, ladies and gentlemen. State of Ohio. I want to go to Ohio this year. I'm trying to figure out where I could stay. Obviously, outlaws are about to swing that way. I'm thinking of taking on the road. We think we got my car ve or vehicle fixed. Um, I do want to do some stuff in Ohio because once again, they had 42 cars the other day at a weekly event or, or regional event. And I've only been to Eldora and I was late catching the end of the race at Attica. Outside of that, I haven't been to any tracks in Ohio and Ohio has some good racers and racing. You know, I think so. I think Cole Duc Duncan's very underrated, but, um, you know, there's like, 15-ish tracks. Millstream is returning this year. I really want to watch a race at Millstream. This is a revival situation. We got to make sure that track has success. You got Ohio Speed Weeks, but it's kind of the same week that it kicks off with Davenport and High Limit. I really want to support the Davenport event with a High Limit series. I think it's going to be one of the best races in the, in the country this year. Um, but Ohio is somewhere I kind of want to go because I've only been... It's crazy how much racing is in Ohio. You know, the Atomics, the Fremonts, and all these tracks... Wayne County and all that. And I've only been to Eldora, basically. Tried to go to Wayne County for the high limit race that rained out last year. That rained out, obviously. But there's some tracks I still want to attend. I could get a list together and mark off some, but I'd probably forget them. Um, let's see. Chat as I am South Dakota. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see. We got, I think Callum gets to Knoxville. He'll put it on him. That track fits his style perfectly. Selins Grove was impressive. You're out qualifying Lucas Wolf. 
Justin Whittall, very uh, you know seasoned racer there. You're out qualifying Mark Smith. You're out qual Lucas Wolf. When I saw Lucas Wolf so d- down the list, I-, I hope somebody spins Lucas Wolf's career around. I don't know what's going on. Equipment, something. Really great race car driver. I- he out qualified Devin Borden, guys. I heard Devin Borden had some motor issues. I mean, he was he was nine thousandths or whatever, seven thousandths behind Freddie Raymer. Ha- uh, you know, three hundredths off of Danny Dietrich on his fifth lap of a half mile in his whole entire life. That's impressive, guys. I'm looking forward to Callum Williamson uh, uh, coming up soon. Uh, Central PA can serve that purpose just because of how full the schedule is. And like you said, good money on a weekly basis with a big with a lot of big money shows. Fast on Dirt had has a real chance to fill the gap of a all-star circuit of champions. But seems like they haven't really done anything to capitalize. High Limit even promoted them for Ohio Speed Week. We will see how far it goes. Yeah, that Fast on Dirt's a very interesting series. It'll be interesting to see how it develops um, over time. It, it would have to get out of the, the area a little bit more. You know, you had the Maverick series start up in Indiana, so they're obviously not going to go that direction. So you'd almost have to depend on, you know, Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania tracks accepting you. And let's be honest, guys. What kind of all-star circuit of champions schedule would you really have had if Central PA didn't accept them and put them on the schedule regularly? I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, yeah, you had the race for Rudin event with the all-stars. You had the one show-up race at Knoxville with the all-stars. I think you had the Lake Ozark shows in there, too. You had some, you know, you had some stuff happen. You had the Volusia stuff. You had the stuff down south. But if PA, over the last five years didn't host the amount of all-star races that they did, and they actually cut a lot of them, I believe, over the last two, three years. It, it slowly got smaller and smaller. Where would all-stars be? I know they did the New York swing. I mean, Ohio, obviously, it's a central hub. Uh, but for Fast on Dirt to really actually, I think people are going to try to do what I'm talking about, where the regions are going to become that all-star level. But if Fast on Dirt is actually trying to fill that gap of all-star circuit of champions, you've got to be accepted by Pennsylvania. You know, you got to have a swing to New York. You you got to do a swing into IRA territory, you know, Wisconsin like they did. Got to go to Michigan maybe. You know, so that's that's a door that could definitely be hard to open if you're fast on dirt, you know. I mean, why would guys want to have you? It's hard now. Uh, people seem to like um, just getting paid more than paying a sanction to come there and have some out-of-towners show up. Um, Let's see here. Great point, Chaz. You don't see many West Coast guys go big and come or and go back to Cali. PA guys come back all the time. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Nobody wants to be stuck on that island known as the West Coast. That's one of the biggest selling points I have for Borden. When when Borden came over in the eight car, eight, I don't know if anybody remembers how this Borden thing happened. Uh, ASCS was supposed to go. He was running 360 National with the ASCS Tour. They went up to PA, canceled their race weekend. He got a motor in the car. And went up against the Outlaws and performed relatively well. I believe it was the 7th, the top 10. I did an interview with him, got his, got him out there, because I'd already dealt with Devin Borden uh, a couple years ago, 2019, with Sanders going over there into the uh, um, Oregon Speed Week. And I was like, who's this Devin Borden kid? Just as quick as Justin Sanders? It's just him and his dad working on the car? Damn, this is impressive. So, similar scenario. They're in PA racing the Outlaws, you know, just them. And I was telling him, I was like, dude, I don't know what the hell you got going on in your race career. We got to get you the hell over here in the PA. You can't go back to the West Coast. You just can't. When you get back there, it's like you've been defeated. I had the same conversation with J.J. Hickle. You know, this is a very similar scenario. ASCS toured out at the Short Track Nationals. I was filming down there with Tucker Dowdy, who outran, you know, Kaylee Bryson in 360 sprint cars like she was a lap car. But regardless, I was there with Tucker Dowdy. I talked to J.J. Hickle. He's like, oh, yeah, the team's shutting down. It looks like I'm going to have to go back home. I'm like, oh, hell no. We got to do something about this. Did an interview with J.J. Hickle. Got him hooked up with the 25, the Eichelberger car, the, all that scenario. That's how that happened. Just because these guys, they, they, going back to the West Coast after getting out is almost like ending your career. It's almost like, that's it. It's over. It's done. That was my shot. They're, they view their shot in the racing world. At least that's what I view. My opinion, these drivers from the West Coast, when they get out of it and get onto the national scene, they view that as their shot at racing. And if they go back to the West Coast, whether that's Washington or California or Oregon, that's like their racing career's over. They've lost. They're, they're shot. It's over. It's it's done. You know, that, that's how it comes across to me. 
And that's why guys are willing to, you know, come out here and, and push the limits and throw a 410 in like the Devin Borden situation. And then luckily, you know, I was able, uh, we were all able, obviously, to, to make something happen there with Borden with the 27 Hefner team. Want to thank Sean Michael for having this dinner and phone call with everybody sitting there. I mean, obviously, I know everybody hates Sean Michael, but I'm just saying that's how that happened because you got this guy who's got a load of talent. I didn't want to see him have to go back there and and getting him that shot to stay away from there. That's that's all they want, man. So it is a very good point. Like you're, like I was explaining and like you're saying, I'm just giving a number, another example of a few guys who are from not even California, just the West Coast. They don't want to go back. They don't want to go back. They want to get out and make something of themselves. Where I just, I, I think if you could make it in PA, you feel like you've made something of yourself. PA guys go back all the time. It's very true. Macquarie's back there. Could have stayed on high limit. No, I'm good. I'll go back to PA. That was to happen with Corey. Say Corey Day. Oh, went back to California. We're going to run NARC this year. Oh, it's over. Career finished. That does that. If Corey Day not jumped off the high limit tour and said, oh, we just want to go back to California and run NARC. I mean, I guess we would give him the Jacob Allen, you know, okay, maybe it was too rough on the, I don't know. Are we going to give it an excuse? But I, I, but we hear Macri do it. Oh, makes sense. 20,000. You want it. Hell, now that makes sense. Oh, a couple weeks from now, you're going to be racing for 75,000. Oh, wow. High limits, World Outlaws coming in. It's just a way better atmosphere over there in PA. It's, and the fans make that happen. Uh, Trone 39 have any equipment left after having Linton Jeffrey run a few weeks for them. That's funny. Uh, I will give you one example. The only driver that turned out to be one of the greatest drivers to come out of South Dakota, and he went to PA to race and kept going up the ranks. Henderson is trying. Justin Henderson, definitely. Um, Hold on. Going to Jacksonville, I am thinking if everything goes right, and we could get some supporters, links in the description. PayPal Venmo will put your name on the top of the screen. And maybe somewhere to stay. Uh, going to Jacksonville, I think I am going to be there. That's going to be my on the way to PA, East Coast Swing, Ohio, potentially New York. I think the whole month of May is an East Coast venture, Ohio, PA, even New York a little bit. That The whole month of May is over there, buddy. That's where you want to be if you're a sprint car racing team or organization or driver. That's where you want to be. And starting that direction is this little fucking badass little fifth mile track where Brandon Shepard's going to be jumping behind the wheel of a 900 horsepower rocket ship known as a sprint car. And that's at the Jacksonville Speedway with the World of Outlaws. Why the high limit series scheduled a 80 or, or I don't know why they're on the same date is the dumbest thing ever. I told Michael Rigsby with Flo, which is the oh, little racing operator over there. I said, you just send a damn message to Brad Sweet and tell him that the servers are going to be down for maintenance on Wednesday, May 1st, and we have to move the date to Tuesday or something. There's no reason that this battle between High Limit and the World of Outlaws is happening on a fucking Wednesday, guys. What the hell is wrong with you? Sorry, when I, when I think of Jacksonville, I think of the excitement of Brandon Shepard in a sprint car, and then I remind my fucking self that High Limit... And the world of outlaws are going up against one another on a fucking Wednesday. Who did this? Who did this? Whoever did it, somebody do something differently. You, you see, it's a mistake, right? Does everybody see this as a mistake? I hope you do. Why can't it be Tuesday, High Limit? Wednesday, World of Outlaws. I told him over at Flow, I was like, this, this battle, the streaming battle you're going to have, and you're going to lose on the weekend, trust me, between the outlaws and High Limit, if you ain't got a bunch of dorks just living their life out between two screens in the, in the room with High Limit and, and Dirt Vision and Flow, they're just cracking out as much as Tyler Walker on racing. I'm just saying, you, you shouldn't be having this battle with the World of Outlaws. Save this shit for fucking Friday and Saturday. Okay? You shouldn't be midweek battling the World of Outlaws between Flow and Dirt Vision. This is just ridiculously dumb. I don't understand why people are doing it, but my plan is... Because of how stupid that decision is, I'm going to take even a more uh, you know, a proprietary stance against the dumb decision of 81 Speedway and restrain myself from even viewing it by going to the Jacksonville Speedway and attending my second World of Outlaw race of the year on my way to Ohio and Pennsylvania. That is what's in my mind. That is the plan currently. That's what I think. That's what I think. But once again, I can't, I can't, I can't believe that is a, is a thing. I can't believe that High Limit and the Outlaws are racing against each other on a fucking Wednesday. Who did that? 
Lucas Wolf is one of the nicest people on the planet and a damn good driver. I agree. That's why I was so surprised when Callum Williamson outdid him, but he's off the pace. Let's just say it right now. Lucas Wolf's off the pace. That's what I'm saying. Let's figure it out. As an Australian, I think if you can go to go run in PA and go okay, you will open the eyes, or you will open eyes years ago. We all wanted to race at Knoxville. For example, for example, Eddie Lumbar has ran the Penn Speedway for the last few years. Uh, Ryan Newton's probably doing extremely well. Uh, it, it, outside of Callum, what he did last night, Ryan Newton fifth at uh, Lincoln was very impressive. Uh, let's see here. I'll be watching B. Shep at Jacksonville on Dirt Vision. World of Outlaw Stan. Oh, my God. Lucas Wolf has been having technical issues a lot this year. I, I think an equipment equipment is the only thing uh, that's holding Lucas back, I think. And I'm not dogging somebody, but it can't be Lucas Wolf, the driver. It's just, he's just too good. I just think he's too good. Uh, Lucas Wolf's car off the pace, Chaz, not him. He's a solid. He's as solid as it gets. That's right. I believe that as well. Uh, we've had some good people come out of North Dakota, a few in the Hall of Fame. I'm not dogging North Dakota. I think your driving talent's good, but I also think you have a regional issue up there as well. Husits doing a lot of great things, but the track don't widen out. They can't race. I'm sure there's a lot of drivers that just don't like that, that race up there weekly. And how much are you developing when that's your weekly scenario? What are you learning in that scenario? How to turn laps? I don't get it. It's a dyno session. Uh, I went there on Saturday. They run four tens once a year during PA Speed Week, mostly crate races with 305 once a month. That's Selling Grove he's talking about. I have no sympathy for Allen. Not everyone gets to live their dream. Walker has wore out his second chances, in my opinion. Well, that's a horrible, horrible take. Uh, Selins Grove, Port Royal, Lincoln, Grove, and Baps are all within a, an hour and a half max of each other, and that's the worst case. I agree. How can you get better than that? How can you get better than that? Unless you're MMR, then you need to go back to the West Coast. Then you need to go back to West Coast. Uh, MMR is probably the only guy who hasn't performed well on the racetrack in PA from the West Coast. I mean, I like Michael Millard a lot, but he hasn't necessarily lit the world on fire in comparison to, to Borden or Hickel or any of the West Coast guys who are in PA or traveling across the country right now. He's probably the one guy who's underperformed everyone. Um, so I don't know why you would say, unless you're him, you need to go back. That makes no sense to me. Very disrespectful. Extremely disrespectful person there who just said that. Thoughts on Texas Sprint Car scene? I mean, it's looking okay, but they don't have a lead dog down there. You know, they don't have a, a top-level driver in Texas, I don't think, right now. An outlaw form. They don't have a Gary Wright, I guess is the best way. To, they don't have a Gary Wright down there kind of leading those guys and training them to get faster. They don't have a lead horse that's on that outlaw level. So they're maybe getting they may be getting more cars down there in Texas, but I don't think they're getting the speed down there in Texas. They're not getting that national challenge, you know. Like I said, Gary Wright, when he was racing down there all them years and could beat the outlaws when they come to town, Gary Wright shows up on a weekly basis, you know, and you beat him you could see yourself running with the outlaws because you just ran with Gary Wright. I don't think they have that guy down there right now. I don't, personally. Um, Somebody just said A-Ron, Aaron Rodgers, or A-Rod, Aaron Rodgers, or not Aaron Rodgers, or Aaron, Aaron Reitzel, sorry, A-Rod, Aaron uh, Rodgers, Aaron Reitzel, uh, but Reitzel's relocated now. He left. He got good enough and left. You know, Reitzel used to be that guy, kind of. Uh, but he didn't really have national success until he left the area. I mean, he had ASC a success, but four tens, you know, coming back down there is going to help him. But in Reitzel's era, he wasn't down there. Why is Sam Haverteep Jr. not able to step up? I just think Sam Haverteep Jr. is not an elite race car driver. I hate to say it. I think he's a good race car driver. I think he's a great 360 driver. But if you had all the talent in the four ten division in the 360s, I think he would be finishing exactly where he is in the 410 division. I just don't think he is that top-level talent uh, that you have to be to really run consistently up front. He shines every now and then. Track's right. This is right. He can he can do well, and, and he ha he's a threat to win sometimes. Obviously, I believe he won the All-Star Race at Eldora last year. Um, so he can win, but is he elite? Is he is he right to level? I don't I don't think he's right to level. 
I, I remember watching Sam Hayford Teep Jr. come up. I mean, I remember seeing him in B mains on a consistent weekly basis in, in sub uh, limited 360 races coming up. Uh, but their family did have the money. He went on the road with the Outlaws, came back and was really good. And, you know, that was 10, 15 years ago. But I think he's had the money to do it long enough to become that decent driver. I, I didn't see natural ability when Sam Hayford Teep Jr. first raced. And I was a kid watching him start off. So I think I could say that. It's not like I'm I'm basing it on results. I'm basing it on visual eye tests. Visual eye tests. What do you think of the 360 Sprint Series down in Louisiana and Alabama? Never heard of it. That's what I think of it. That's a problem. Everything needs to go 410. Get rid of the 360s. Yes, Jonathan Winnett. Roy City, I remember that. Do you know Eric Winnett? Eric Winnett was pretty good. Eric Winnett was better than uh, Sam Haverteep Jr. Jeff Day was a better sprint car driver in Texas than Sam Haverteep Jr. There was a lot of drivers in in, in Sam Haverteep Jr. Or in, in Texas that were better than Sam Haverteep Jr. Travis Rowlett had some promise. He did. He did as well. He had opportunities as well. Um, He had opportunities as well. Walker has to help himself until then. Nobody can help him. He looks like he's smoking meth. I mean, he he titled the video the other day, Smoking Crack. So that's uh, that's the situation. Yeah, yeah. Eric Winnett was really good, especially at Caltown. Really, really good driver. If I hit Powerball, I would buy a car and get T-Dub to drive it with some stipulations, obviously. I guess it would depend on what those stipulations are on if that's going to be a success or not. Um, Have a great night, Chaz. I got to go to work. I agree. I got to go do some stuff as well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Be sure to super chat or join the support in the description. Membership button is down at the bottom of the screen as well. You could support just as much as anyone else. By just clicking the subscribe button. If you are not subscribed to the channel, there is the button down there to click it. We are going to have a special high limit show tomorrow all around this Riverside scenario that they got going on at the ditch. This race tomorrow night is going to be very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Could a local show up the high limit series outside of the PA and West Coast and, you know, Knoxville, Houston's upper Midwest areas? Can a local show up down there at Riverside, the home of Greg Hodnett, the home of Sammy Swindell? Riverside or National Speedway. What's going to happen? It'll be interesting. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, uh, like the video, share the video around, comment below with what you think if you haven't already. Uh, give it a thumbs up as you as uh, Glenn Wolski just said in the, in the chat. And as always, be sure to subscribe. We will catch you next time. As long as we make the show